Good evening. I'm Michael Williams. I'm the director of the Wheeler Centre, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here tonight. Um, I say a lot of disingenuous things on these stages, uh, and I'll often bandy around words like favourite, and every other time it's been insincere. <laughs> but not tonight. Uh, I, honestly, there are lots of thrills in this job, but having a moment where you're meeting the Jennifer Egan and she says, call me Jenny, is a bit kind of like you're just, oh, I can't, I can't go on. It's uh, like I'm sure so many of you, I am a massive fan of her work. I'd ask you to give a big round of applause to her before we get started. I would also like us to take a moment just to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past and present and the elders and members of other communities who may be with us this evening. Acknowledgement of country for us isn't a rote recitation uh, that we do uh, unthinkingly. We like to pause at the start of our events. We like to take a moment to uh, think about the stories that have come before, the conversations that have come before, the ones that we're holding. Uh, for me, acknowledgement of country is in part an acknowledgement that the moral and legal implication of invasion remains unresolved to this day. So it's, also, it's also really interesting, so Jenny, is here as a guest of the Wheeler Centre and Sydney Writers Festival. And you may have seen the Wheeler Centre has had a number of international guests over the past week or so. And it's interesting talking to writers from elsewhere and seeing them here in acknowledgement of country for the first time, because there's, there's a sense in which it is very much a local thing, and it leads to these questions. And none of the answers ever feel very satisfying or very good. Um, but Jennifer Egan's been asking sensible questions with satisfying answers uh, for some years now. She's the author of five previous books of fiction. Visit from the Goon Squad won the Pulitzer Prize in the National Book Critics Circle Award. The Keep, the story collection Emerald City. Look at Me, which was a National Book Award finalist. And The Invisible Circus. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, Granter and McSweeney, and The New York Times Magazine. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two sons, and her new book is Manhattan Beach, which is Absolutely spectacular. Jennifer Egan, I'm going to start by asking you to read the epigraph at the front of A Visit from the Goon Squad, if you would. Shall I read them both? I think so, okay. if that's OK. So these are from uh, Proust's In Search of Lost Time. The first one is, poets claim that we recapture for a moment the self that we were long ago when we enter some house or garden in which we used to live in our youth. But these are most hazardous pilgrimages, which end as often in disappointment as in success. It is in ourselves that we should rather seek to find those fixed places contemporaneous with different years. And the second one is, the unknown element of the lives of other people is like that of nature, which each fresh scientific discovery merely reduces but does not abolish. They're both really wonderful passages that resonate a lot in Visit from the Goon Squad, but actually revisiting them uh, this week, it struck me how much they seem to underpin what you're doing in Manhattan Beach. Do you... Manhattan Beach is a departure for you in that it's a historical novel and you've been celebrated for your temporal tricksiness with your earlier novels. How much... Um, how much did that change the way you had to approach the writing task? Well, I approached it the same way, and I think in doing so, I discovered that I was going to be writing differently than I had in the last book. In a way, that, that was no surprise, because that really happens almost every time to me. But I, I feel the same discomfort and have to go through the same weird process of, of letting go of a voice or, a, or an approach that it has been with me for so long that I feel like I don't quite know what I'm doing without it. So I have, to, I have to basically reach the same state of incompetence every single time, in which all the lessons that I learned, the kind of hard-won lessons of the previous book, are essentially useless to me. So in the case of this one, the way that came about was, I mean, and, and when I say I approach them the same way, I mean that I approach them all through handwriting with no real plan, no characters and no plot before I start a first draft, but just a sense of time and place. 
And so in this, in Manhattan Beach, I, I did that. I had been doing some research but, um, so that I, I wasn't just in an absolute vacuum. Um, but I started writing, and I, I had the idea that I would be playing with time in the book. Um, and I thought specifically that I would try to acknowledge with the reader that this time I'm writing about has passed and many events have happened in between and we have a sense of what those are. And I didn't want to, I thought it might seem weird if I didn't acknowledge that. But I found that when I, when I did acknowledge it by sort of winking at the reader or speaking from the present day about the events, calling attention to the artificiality of the fact that I was writing this you know, as if it were the present when it's really the past, it was so tiresome. Um, it made, it, I mean, and I have a writing group, which is wonderful, um, and they help me in all kinds of ways, but the way they help me first with any book is to sort of just give me a sense of whether the material feels alive and has a pulse. And whenever this stuff happened in what I was reading, I mean, they started out by just saying, you know, I don't think that really works when you do that. And then the second time I did it, they said, yeah, you know, we, we really don't like it when, when you do that. And the third time, someone finally said, you know, it kind of makes me angry when you do that. <laughs> I thought, okay, this is not working. I think I can officially say I need to leave this behind. So, yeah, so I, I ended up writing in a more straightforward way. And what I found was that as soon as I embraced that, I was so thrilled. I, I realized that in a way I had gotten kind of tired of myself doing that other stuff, writing in a more fragmentary way. And what writing in a more um, sort of traditional scene-making way let me do was tell stories that were much more kind of full-blooded and old-fashioned, where the action's happening right on the page, like shipwreck, let's say, or survival at sea. The idea of, of approaching that sort of obliquely and ironically, how would you do that? Mm. I mean, a ship is sinking. It's no time for a wink and a nod. Like, just give us the ship. Let's see it. You clearly haven't seen Titanic recently. <laughs> I actually love that movie. It's all <laughs> I'm embarrassed at how much I loved it. Billy Zane and the Picasso. That's a wink and a nod halfway <laughs> through, right there. It's, um, but uh, I'm interested because one of the engines for this book, one of the inspirations in the first place, if I remember correctly, was September 11. It was the idea of New York under attack, and that led you to look at the kind of historical instance of it. Did that remain as a kind of ghost through the book, even if you weren't explicitly acknowledging that link? It did. I mean, it, it's suggested all the time by the fact that, I mean, for example, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is one of the locations where a lot of the action takes place, there was very tight security and packages were opened and, and drinks were sniffed to make sure they weren't alcohol. and. All this, you know, a lot, there was a lot of security. And when I read, again, when I read some of this to my writing group, they said, well, that seems kind of exaggerated. Aren't you sort of imposing our contemporary security standards on them? And I said, no, that's, that's really how it was. So the fact that New York felt uh, vulnerable and may, created an echo already. Um, and in a way, that was the, the kind of the understanding that I came to about how to manage this seemingly artificial gap between the time I'm writing about it and the present, I realized I don't have to acknowledge it. We all understand that it's not actually 1942, and the events between then and now float like a kind of subtext. It, it's, it, it's almost an allegorical presence that I don't need to acknowledge or, or you know, be silly about. It's just there. And you're a big fan of Victorian novels, aren't you? I really am, yeah. I, I yeah, I, I feel like uh, they just they do a lot of the things that I find myself wanting to do, and I guess the number one on that list is just doing a lot at once. Um, they're such big, ambitious, swaggering, copious works in which lots of different stories are told, lots of different lives. I love that. Mm. Is that a harder? I mean. That, I'm interested, one of the things that was so um, powerful in Goon Squad that uh, I thought of uh, when you were reading that Proust quote was the way in which T. 
temporarily jumping around gave a sense of inevitability to the things that happened to your characters. You would flag something that was coming in the future, you would, um, you would give us insights for where something existed on a, on a continuum. And to hear you say that when you do your first draft, there's no plan, is, is fascinating to me. Like, how does it unfold? How do, you, how do you discover where it's going? Well, I'll tell you how it happened for Goon Squad. Basically, I knew I was going to be writing a book that required a lot of research, and I had done some of the very little research, really. I found myself very reluctant to begin it. And so I was having dinner with my mother um, at a hotel in New York, and I went to use the ladies' room. And while I was washing my hands, I noticed a wallet in a bag underneath the sink. And I immediately thought, oh my god, someone's going to steal that. My, you can't leave a wallet like that in New York. And then I thought, well, I could steal it. <laughs> And the reason I think that that was a curious moment for me is that I've been robbed an insane number of times and ways. Um, and so, and, and, and in one particular theft, which really stands out, uh, was in New York and my, my wallet was stolen and I was supposed to fly later in the day. And this was pre 9-11, so it wasn't that I couldn't get through without ID, but I had no money to get to the airport and it was all a big mess. And in the middle of, of worrying about this, the phone rang and lo and behold, it was someone from the Citibank Fraud Recovery Program. And she said, you know, we understand your wallet's been stolen. And I started crying. And she said, let's just, you know, this happens all the time. Like, we're going to replace things one by one. So you had a credit card. And now it's, I need to issue a new cash card for you. So you have to pick a new PIN number. And I did that. And she said, no, no, it can't be the same as your old one. And I said, no, it isn't. And I mentioned what the old one had been. The conversation ended very quickly then because <laughs> she was the thief. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So now she'd gotten the PIN number out of me. <laughs> so she sprinted to the nearest cash machine and overdrew my account. So when all of this came to light, I mean, I was upset before that. <laughs> so after all of this came to light, I was like out of my mind. Anyway, it all, it was really not as big a deal as I thought, of course. You know, banks are insured against this. I, I somehow, someone lent me money. I did get to the airport. All of it was reimbursed. But I, I found myself fixated on the woman because we had spoken for like eight minutes or something. And I kept thinking, well, what was she thinking? Which in a way is kind of silly because I think what she was thinking was, I think this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I thought, well, what was her life like? Anyway, I, I, you know, I was sort of wheel spun about this and then finally kind of forgot about it. But in the moment of seeing that wallet, I reconnected with that curiosity about the thief. And so anyway, I went back and finished dinner with my mother and I thought, you know, I think tomorrow instead of wondering about whether I should actually start this historical novel, I'm just going to start from that moment and, and write one woman sees another woman's wallet, boom, let's go. So I started writing, and I wrote what became the first chapter, which I thought was just a short story to entertain me. And then uh, in, in the course of writing that, there was a mention of the boss of the wallet thief, who sprays pesticide in his armpits and um, eats gold flakes. And I thought, well, that's odd. Why does he do those things? So I thought, OK, I'm going to write one more story about him from his point of view, and I'm going to answer those questions. And then in the course of that, there was a mention of his ex-wife. And I thought, well, she's kind of interesting. Why don't I? And then I thought, OK, this is gay. This is really getting a little out of control. So we're going to call it a trilogy. And this one is the last one. So I wrote a story about his wife. And, then I, and in the course of doing that, I thought, you know, I really want to stick with these people. So, in, so that's kind of a very long answer to say that by the time I even knew it was a book, most of the major structural decisions had been made because I hadn't realized I was writing a book. And those were each chapter stands on its own. Each chapter feels technically different from the others and actually like part of a different book. That was the, probably the radical part of it. Um, and the last was, what was the last? Oh, I guess, I guess yeah, each, each one is about a different person. Each is different technically from the others and each stand on its own. Those were the three things. So I just kept doing that. What fascinates you? I mean, it you say that like it was this uh, kind of casual thing and you produced a masterpiece by doing it. But <laughs> you, 
What fascinates me is that sounds to me like, for you, the pleasure of writing lies in surprising yourself to a certain extent. That is the chief pleasure. Is that harder to do when you're writing history? Ah, that's such a good question. Um, actually, no. It was not harder to surprise myself in that in that first draft, there were many surprises. Uh, I mean, really enormous ones. Most of the surprises that happened for the reader were also surprises to me. And there, this is a book with a lot of spoilers, so I have to be a little careful. That's no, very much a Victorian novel. There are a like lot of twists that. and turns. Those were twists and turns for me in that I hadn't planned any of those. And often I was planning for the opposite. Do you make a little involuntary noise when that happens? When you suddenly go, <laughs> no, wait. Huh? I don't know. I might. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, but then there's a lot of uh, planning and, and prodding and working with the material to really build around those moves once I know what they are. But the interesting thing is, so there were surprises, but what was really hard with this book was that there was a very long period where I just didn't feel fluent enough in, in the period. It wasn't that I didn't know about clothes or cigarettes. It, it's not that, because with Google, you can really learn that stuff so fast. It was more that you know, we all bring to this moment our pasts individually, individual pasts, kind of cultural pasts and collective pasts. And therefore, writing about a present that is in 1942 means feeling, kind of knowing almost uh, instinctively what someone, say, 60 years old, is remembering, you know, what, what that person's point of view consists of, which is everything before that time. Anyway, all of that, it took a long time before I felt fluent enough to start having fun in the material. So that meant that it was very stiff for a while. Like there wasn't much humor, there wasn't much craziness. It just felt like I was sort of barely getting by. And that was very worrying because I knew that if that was the best I could do, I was never gonna publish this. Um, that was, that was uh, concerning. Do you remember, was there a single moment where it clicked into place? I feel like when I got to maybe my third big draft, I could feel that I was starting to loosen up. And I think maybe by then I had just done so much research, which I had to do in a very rote way. I mean, it's like any sort of, I mean, there was a lot of impressionistic research, but there was also just a lot of intense list keeping. Like I had timelines, I had, I, I took notes from books, like very detailed notes, ship terminology. Um, you know, I, I just kept tons of lists like this. And at a certain point, it was as if I find, it was a lot, I think a good analogy is learning another language. You have to learn the grammar, you have to learn the vocabulary. It feels like, how will this ever actually come together into a kind of comfort, fluency? Um, and until that time, and I, speak, I say this as someone who's not fluent in another language, you essentially are a dumber version of yourself in that other language. You don't get jokes, you can't make jokes, um, you, you sort of can't express anything, you, you seem to be incapable of complex thought. Um, that's kind of what, I was the writer version of that for quite a while. The, um because the research is extraordinary for this book, but part of why I'm not a massive reader of historical fiction generally, I tend to find the history gets in the way of my enjoyment of the story or the characters. It's, uh, sometimes the research is worn too heavily, I think, in historical fiction, and you don't fall into that trap here at all. But you clearly... Diving, for example, when we spoke the other day, you uttered the immortal phrase, I fell in with a, I fell in with a club of retired Army Navy divers. And I thought, fell in with a club of retired Navy divers is definitely an exciting thing to happen to a writer. <laughs> It was exciting. <laughs> um, they were actually army divers. Um, but yeah, they have a very strong veterans association. I think maybe because there are fewer army divers than Navy, uh, and they meet every two years for a reunion. Um, yeah, that was the kind of research that was really, and that was very impressionistic research. That was sort of different from the vocabulary learning, for example. Um, but I think, I mean, the reason that the, the research was so intense was that there was not a single world in the book in which I knew anything. I mean, the shipbuilding, 
Um, deep sea diving in 1942, when the equipment was completely different, uh, um, basically waterfront crime and organized crime generally in New York, and the merchant, mer merchant sailing during World War II. I mean, these are realms in which some people know a lot, and I knew nothing. So that was, I felt very empty-handed, and that wasn't uh, a delusion. I mean, that was actually the fact. So it was it, it's another analogy. That I, I sometimes felt like, why do I feel so helpless? And I thought, I feel like I'm trying to build the bridge as I walk across the bridge. <laughs> like, I, had, I felt so empty-handed. But at a certain point, it was as if... I began, a, a kind of spectral bridge began to coalesce that I could start to actually walk across. And that was, uh, that was a thrill beyond any I've experienced as a writer. Could you share with the audience the story of trying on a diving suit for us? Sure. Well, so there, I, uh, one of the attractions of, the, of these reunions for the, the gentlemen who, uh, there actually have been a, a few female army divers, but there were none there that year, um, is that they, if they want to, they can wear the old Mark V diving dress, which, is, which I think any of us can conjure, the, the spherical helmet, the, um, you know, the, the lead belt and, and heavy boots, and they can dive in a tank. And that's fun because for most of them, um, they actually wore that equipment at one point or another. It was actually worn into the 60s. So I got to watch people do that, which was really interesting. Um, when I watched a guy blow up, meaning that he lost control of his air supply and popped to the top, and that was a tense moment, but he was laughing and it was all fine. So they dressed me. That, these two guys who had been already helping me quite a bit and actually had invited me to the reunion now were my tenders. And so every diver, at least in this heavy equipment, has two tenders, and their job is to first dress the diver, which is the first step in keeping the diver alive because the equipment really has to be correct and, and calibrated correctly. So these guys were um, people I had spoken to and, and knew a little bit, and now suddenly they were, they were dressing me, which felt a little odd. I was standing there in long underwear. Um, and, and in a way, even dressing is not quite the right word because it's almost like having a machine assembled around you. The helmet actually screws into the breastplate. Um, and, uh, and, and the whole thing weighs 200 pounds, and most of that 200 pounds seems to hit right there and there. So it, was, it became extremely painful to wear it. I mean, really, really uncomfortable, kind of in a, an acute way that kept raising the question of whether I could take it. Um, and so, you know, but I, I did, and I, there was no way I was backing down. Uh, and then someone was photographing it, which was great. And if anyone's interested, you can see some pictures of this on my website. Um, and then I very briefly stood up and <laughs> got the picture. But it's interesting, the, the takeaway from all of it, 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 was, it was great to have the experience of all that weight, to feel the pain of it, to smell it and all that. But um, what I really got out of that experience was something I hadn't been expecting at all, which was the, the odd intimacy of being dressed by these men. And, um, and the kind of, at first, as I said, I felt uncomfortable, but they were clearly so comfortable with it that that made me settle down and realize that this was a kind of, almost like a domestic intimacy. And, and it, it felt really nice, actually, and that, that sensation of being suddenly connected to these guys I had spoken to before in that way was actually became kind of an important plot element. And that's an example of the way that that research I was doing long before I started the book, you know, that was 2009. Goon Squad hadn't even come out when I was at that reunion. Some of that would just float into my mind without my expecting it and, and figured in the plot in various ways. Given it had such an impact on you putting it on, did it make you, I mean, where does the research line stop? Were you tempted to dive? They would never have let me dive. I mean, that would have been out of the question. Yeah, I mean, these were master divers who with years and years of experience. But I guess I could have gone and gotten a scuba. Yeah. I, it never even occurred to me, honestly. I, I, I felt like my job was to 
was to, I, I felt like the relationship I wanted to have to diving was kind of a literary relationship. So I approached it like a journalist, which, which I also am, which is very helpful um, in, in all the, the immense amount of research I had to do for this. I have to say some journalistic ex experience really helped. Um, so I just interviewed people about the, the sensations. And somehow that seemed to be enough in this case. It isn't always. I mean, I've had experiences where, like for example, in my novel, The Keep, I'm writing about a, pr a prison, and it's also a gothic thriller. And since the gothic doesn't really exist, it's sort of a literary realm, I thought, OK, this is a book in which all I'm going to do is read books for my research. So I read books about prison architecture, and I had floor plans of prisons, and I had memoirs of people in prison. And I thought, well, surely this is enough. It somehow wasn't. I felt like I needed to actually spend some time in a prison. And once I did that, then I had better access to all of this reading I had done. But for diving, that didn't happen. It felt like just talking to people and, and, and reading and asking questions. And by that, I mean, I would get on the phone and I would walk through a dive with a diver on the phone. OK, what would you do next? And then what would you do? And when would you adjust the uh, air supply nozzle? In which direction would you turn it? I mean, so it, it got very granular. Were those divers uh tough readers of it when you'd read them? Were they stress testing the things um, that you They were great. I mean, uh, well, I should mention one of them whom I'm so grateful to is the first female army diver, a woman named Andrea Motley Crabtree. She did not dive until 1984, so wow. imagine. And she was driven out of diving by sexism. So um, it was, she, but she was not bitter. It was just a fact. Um, and she was incredibly helpful. Um, Motley Crabtree is the best surname I've ever Isn't that heard. wild? That's I think Motley is her, is her maiden name and Crabtree is her married name. I can name. see why you keep them and pair them together. <laughs> it's irresistible. She was fabulous. Anyway, they all read it. Um, and there was one guy, one gentleman who was particularly helpful with just a, I mean, of course, there were things that were wrong. Um, but not many, because I, it's in those realms I had researched so carefully. But I, in all of the technical realms, I had people vetting it. So I had a 93-year-old um, merchant mariner, Norm Schoenstein, who was a, a, an engineering officer who, I'm not kidding, ran up and down the ladders to the engine room with me to show me all kinds of things at 93. Um, and now at 95 is complaining that he's not allowed to drive at night. Um, <laughs> So yeah, they were, I had people helping a lot. There actually, a, there were a number of factual errors, though not in those areas where I had worked so hard, but in some areas where I wasn't thinking about enough <laughs> about certain details. So I've, I'm fixing things all the time. And it is interesting because technology and mechanisms play a part in all your work. You're clearly interested in in them and. Until now, it's always been a kind of forward-looking thing. Your prescience about technological developments in Goon Squad, for example, is eerie. Like you're, you're a long way ahead of kind of uh, internet influences, for example. Well, I feel like I was only about six. I mean, I was, you know, I was a little ahead of the iPhone, but not by much. I mean, so I don't know. I feel like I'm a little ahead. But, but not enough to really get too much credit, because in the end, it just reads as verisimilitude, <laughs> you know? No, it's eerie. It's science fiction. But the, the James Wood said historical fiction was science fiction that looks backwards. Did, did you find your relationship with the technology was the same if you're writing about old things that were gone? Well, not exactly, because I think my interest in technology up until now has been on the ways in which image culture interacts with our psyches and, and our relationship to the world. This was, I think, one thing that drew me to this period, but I didn't realize it until I got started, is that it was before the era of the small screen. So movies were really important, um, but there were no televisions and obviously nothing else. And that was great. I loved being freed from that, because I feel like contending with the influence of the small screen on our lives has become, has been, an, a, a fascination of mine, starting with my first novel and, and onward. So I guess in this one, the, the technology is, is more, I think, about trying to 
um, write authoritatively about, about w various kinds of workplaces, which is always really hard to do. You know, people who are at work do what they do almost by second nature. So to write about them doing that is really hard. You have to really know your stuff. But there, it is interesting that, there, that the book is so technical in certain ways. I felt like that was just sort of the price I had to pay. I mean, I, I thought, do I really have to go through all this to get someone into the water diving? I did. I mean, there was no other way to do it. That's interesting, though, because it suggests an idea that you have an obligation, whether it's because it's historical or to fact, to, to making sure that detail is correct, that it's not enough for you to just say, well, I'll make it up. I need her to be in the water, so I'm going to make an imaginative version of this. No. I mean, there's plenty of imagining. I mean, the fact that she gets in the water at all is a huge leap. I yeah. mean, extremely unlikely that that happened at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Difficult to prove that it didn't because civilian diving was not documented in the same way. I mean, if, for example, I would never have made her a Navy diver. Because women didn't dive in the Navy until the 70s, it would have been absurd, and it would have really troubled people who understood those things deeply. Um, and that's kind of why the technical details really do matter. And in a way, I feel you earn the leaps by, by really understanding the, um, the granular nature of the enterprise. That's how you get the authority to then <coughs> make certain jumps. That's your contract with the Raiders. I guess. I mean, I, it's a little bit of my contract with myself, too. I mean, there are a lot of things in the book that definitely strain, push against the possible. For another, for another thing, I've got a, a crime boss, a sort of very a powerful gangster who has married the, the daughter of a, of a really old money, sort of blue-blooded American. Okay, that's another, that's a real stretch, but it's not impossible. And it's funny because when I first, when that first st started to happen on the page, I, I was so excited by it because I love it when I can make disparate worlds fuse. Um, and I thought, oh, this is, I just love that this is happening. But then there was a part of me that thought, but can it really happen? I have to make sure. But the truth is that it really was plausible for another whole reason that I think I had begun to absorb in that period of research almost without knowing it, which is that the gangster occupied sort of a different role in the culture than, than he or she would now, which really was because of prohibition and the mm -hmm. fact that um, you know, so-called gangsters, and it became almost like a job, a, a, a legitimate job description um, during Prohibition, were basically liquor dealers. And since, you know, mainstream and upper echelon uh, society in America wanted to drink, these were welcome figures to them. And they remained in the mix because so many popular nightclubs were, had been speakeasies. So these became places where politicians mingled with movie stars. And again, the, the quote unquote gangster was sort of part of that. So it actually was just possible, I felt. You can see what you think. <laughs> I'm convinced. Now, I've been deliberately circumspect because, as you say, there are lots of uh, twists and surprises and revelations in the book. But I feel like our conversation thus far hasn't done justice to the beautiful characters at the heart of it. This is a book about family and it's a book about um, the relationship between a daughter and her father. Um, and that stuff is incredibly kind of... It's so beautifully done. I, I loved it. And I wanted to ask a little bit about Anna and where their character comes in for you with this stuff. Like uh, the Proust quote that we heard at the start uh, talked a bit about place and the role place plays in determining story and memory. Um, where does place sit with character for you? For me, place yields character. So I start with a place and an atmosphere. In the case of this book, I would say I started with New York during World War II through a kind of noirish lens. I really wanted that shadowy, urban feeling that we know from film, but also from detective fiction. And it's, the, all of that was really appealing to me. I love, I love th the feeling of a thriller. I just feel like every book should be a thriller, really, in the sense that we should be you know, invested enough that it really feels like it matters what happens. I mean, a thriller just means the stakes are high, really. And that can be true in 
any sort of drama. Um, so I, I had a, like, in a way, almost like a shadowy sense that there would be a young woman doing industrial work of some kind, um, because that's a, a wartime story that I wanted to, that I knew theoretically, but I wanted to understand more viscerally. Um, I had a sense that there would be some kind of crime, a criminal figure. And then I, I felt that the girl's father would have some role, and I was interested in him as a kind of troubled Irish-American guy. Um, so th that's sort of all I knew. And then the, I have the hardest time explaining how exactly one creates a character, because it never quite feels that way, since I don't use people I know, and, and in fact go a little cold when I try to do that. I just, you know, I'm, I'm look, I, again, this is where the handwriting and the, and the um, trying to get outside of my conscious mind, out a little bit ahead of it, ideally, um, seems to be the way that I can best uh, discover, that's the feeling, people that are really lively and, and feel complicated and interesting. Um, you know, sometimes people don't work. Like, for example, the gangster, whose name is Dexter Styles. Um, in my first draft, there, were, there was a, he, he started out well, but then he became very mopey. Um, and, and it was really unsuccessful. Like, he sort of, he became kind of lugubrious toward the middle of the book. And I, I, I was just, my skin was crawling when I had to read those sections later. I thought, oh, how could I have gone so wrong? And I realized that the mistake I had made was that in a way I had sort of let my own psyche intrude on his a little. You know, I'm someone who will ruminate and, and question. That's, he's, a, he's a guy who, to a fault, has to act. His way of responding to that impulse is to do something. And so I had just sort of let myself kind of intrude, and, and so that was just a matter of, of intense revision. But that's just a kind of a, a way of saying that that's sort of how I try to work with character. Often writing characters with disability, and especially profound disability, into work they can be reduced to plot device, I think. It's something that irritates me beyond belief. But Anna's sister, Lydia, in this book is a beautifully drawn character and the dynamic within the family around Lydia is incredibly moving. Did you have to work at that or did that... that how conscious were you of the pitfalls of writing a character like that? Well, I was... I mean... I was very startled to find that I was going to be writing about a character like that. And, and it, it happened right away. You know, I started on a beach um, in, during the Depression, and the three major characters sort of appeared right away. You know, Anna's visiting the beach with her father. She, they're visiting Dexter Styles. She has a sense that they, she, her father has some sort of working relationship with this man, and also that he's kind of afraid of him. Um, and immediately, uh, Dexter Styles' wife says, well, where is your wife to Anna's father? And he says that the younger daughter has taken sick and the wife has stayed home to nurse her. And even as I wrote that, I thought, it's, it, she's not just sick, there's something more. When we get to the apartment and see that she's severely disabled, unable to sit up, unable to really talk, except in a kind of, um, in a sort of mimicking way, I thought, oh gosh, is this really, is this really what I want to be doing here? I, I really questioned it. I think for exactly the reason you, I mean, I guess partly thinking there's something very undramatic about a person who has very little agency. And I thought, this is going to be a lot to deal with. Um, do I want to? And what I found was that she seemed right from the get-go to be inextricable. Um, not just because a lot of the action revolves around her and because she is a, a kind of catalyst in the family. Um, for one thing, has created a huge gulf between her mother and father because her mother has responded to her um, problems with a kind of wild devotion. Um, and the father is filled with shame. So that's, that's created a, a huge gulf between the two of them. Um, and, but, but it was more than that. I began to feel with a kind of excitement that I would enter into Lydia's consciousness. And I was so looking forward to that. And one thing that's kind of interesting, you were asking sort of how 
place and character interact, often as I'm moving through the plot, I will have a sense of where things are going to happen, but not exactly what will happen. So place continues to beckon me. And, and, I'll, and as I move toward it, I'll have a better sense of who will be there. And then once they're there, I know that sort of exciting things will happen. And in the case of the, the period where I enter into Lydia's mind, I had a, a sense that it would happen on Manhattan Beach in, in company with certain other people. Again, I don't want to give things away. Um, and and I, I moved toward that, and it was so exciting to finally get there and, and do it. And it wasn't that it was right the first time at all, but I could feel that it was the right thing to be doing because I just had a kind of excitement as I did it and then through revision tried to improve it. Several times tonight you have made references to, maybe it's a product of the longhand uh, process you have for writing your books or your drafting process, but you talk about earlier versions of your work in fairly scathing terms regularly. You're kind of very self-critical. Are you a good reader of your own work? Do you go back to previous books? Oh, I mean, for fun? Yeah. Oh. Go no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Although, I mean, now and then, if I have to read from them, I will think it's not bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, but, but I, um, I can be a little harsh, it's true. Uh, and I, I think with Manhattan Beach, I really felt, in retrospect, that I was a terrible boss of myself. You know, if, if someone spoke to their employee in the way that I spoke to myself, that employee would rightly file a complaint about, you know, excessive criticism, you know, abusive tone. Um, and I think I created bad working conditions for myself sometimes. Yeah, there was one interview where you, you went on about how unhappy you were with an earlier draft. You talked about being nauseated by it, kind of sick to your stomach. I was. It was, it, I mean, because I think that in a way that also gets at sort of the function writing has in my life. It's, it feels like it's the thing that, that gives life meaning for me. It's, it's, it's something like a belief system. Um, and, and in a way, I think that that's reflected too in the kind of the way I don't feel like I have a lot of agency in it. You know, it feels like it's sort of happening through me. So when it's going well, I feel so enriched by it and, and almost um, beyond that, sort of transcendently alive. And when it's going badly, I feel as if I've got an open vein and all of my blood is just pouring out of me. So it, it, it really, it, it, I become incredibly down when writing is going badly. I can't, it's so hard for me to hold on to the perspective, which my, you know, my friends and family desperately try to instill in me, which is, you know, you have felt this way before. No, this is worse <laughs> every time. I think with Manhattan Beach, it actually, I, I was, I was so, I felt so vindicated when my husband said, okay, I actually think this is worse. This is the worst <laughs> you've been. <laughs> You're, you're, you're beyond any state of hopelessness I've seen you in before. I was like, yes, I told you, this is the worst. <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, I know. I'm so unhappy. <laughs> Such a good thing. There's, uh, uh, at the back of the book in the acknowledgements, uh, we don't really have time to go into, there's some lovely lines in there about how lucky you felt to be doing the research. But you quote your brother, uh, for teaching you the necessity of gunpowder in any work of art. And I thought it's a lovely line. And I'm, I'm curious about it. What's gunpowder in your work? Well, I don't really know what that means exactly, but when I was struggling with um, the PowerPoint chapter of Goon Squad, I had dinner with Graham, my brother, and I, I felt like I had gotten to a point and I couldn't seem to get beyond it. I felt like I was just sort of stuck. And he said, he, I can't remember exactly, he basically said, well, you just need to get out the gunpowder. Like, just make it happen, basically. Like, don't, you know, just be explosive. Do, do the thing that feels impossible to do. Just kind of crash your way through it, even if it takes some violence. And I, I, I don't know if that's what he meant, um, but that's somehow what I, what I heard was what I needed to hear to get me over that hump. And I think what I actually ended up doing was 
playing the same song on repeat for several hours and walking around Brooklyn until I felt like I, I had some notion of how to proceed. And I should just say too that my brother who was, um, who passed away, who committed suicide actually almost two years ago, was schizophrenic and uh, a very creative, incredibly intelligent and reasonable. We used to laugh and say, you're the sanest crazy person on earth. Um, but you know, became very worn down by his state. But we, our minds were so close together. You know, he had a. He said something that that made my mother and me laugh so hard, which was, he said, "I can't believe this. You hear voices and you're making a living from it, and <laughs> I hear voices and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm spending a fortune trying to get rid of them." <laughs> so we both, you know, it, it's amazing how close especially the kind of unconscious approach that I have to writing, in which I do feel as if these things are kind of coming through me, almost as if I am hearing them. But, you know, when you really hear voices as if there were people in the room talking, it's so intrusive that it's impossible to live a normal life. And so I feel that, you know, we were so close together, but I had the lucky version and he had the unlucky version. But he left you gunpowder. Yeah, he's, he is in me, you know, gunpowdering away, um, and will always be, I feel. The Australian author Kate Grenville um, won the Orange Prize for her book, The Idea of Perfection. And in that book, kind of key plot elements uh, included br an engineer who's an expert in bridge building and a lot of stuff about quilt making. And she researched kind of tirelessly in preparation for, for the book. And then the book was done and the research was gone. Like it was suddenly no longer having been consumed by passion in this new area of knowledge, suddenly it was behind her. Is that how it is for you? Or are you going to hang on to diving and navy yards and the rest of it? I think, I think it's exactly the way she described it. It's very strange. I mean, even, even this time a year ago when I was still in page proofs, I was still researching. I was still reading, you know, I was reading cheesy detective fiction and pull it, plucking out every phrase that seemed interesting and still adding it to my lists of, you know, local color and all the other lists I had. And at one point my husband said, why are you doing that? I mean, your book is done. And I felt like, but I wanted to stay there mentally all the way to the end. And I think even, even in those late phases, I was still employing interesting things. I would actually find a way to add them into the page proof. So, and I, I feel really sad about that in a way. I kind of want to be there still. Working on the book really changed my relationship to New York. Um, I now walk through the city looking at the buildings and thinking about when they were built and all the things that might have happened there. So it's almost like the inverse of that Proust quote because he's writing about going to a place hoping to find an earlier version of yourself, but I've become fixated on all the things that have happened in, in structures and places that have history to them and wondering what sort of trace, if any, or vibration those, those experiences have left. So it's, awa it's wakened up the city for me to think about history in that way. So I guess that's, that's what I'm left with. But in terms of, I'm not on the elliptical machine reading How to Abandon Ship anymore. <laughs> That seems a crying shame. <laughs> There's a question down here. Jennifer, um, Manhattan Beach, would it make a good movie? Is there anything on the table? And are you interested in TV screenplays? Uh, it has been optioned. Um, who knows? You know, options come and go, I'm learning. Um, I'd have no idea if it would make a good movie. Um, I guess it really depends on the vision of the filmmaker, if, if it ever reaches that point. Uh, do I have an interest in writing t for TV? 0.00. .00. Um, the reason is that I feel like I, I, I'm interested in TV. It isn't that. I just feel like I hope I have many productive years ahead of me, like, you know, 50, I mean, 55. Is it too much to ask that I'd still be writing at 105? But even, even if that's the case, if I'm lucky enough to be doing that, I feel like why not just try to keep getting better at the thing that I'm doing now rather than try to start something new 
And, and I have a huge learning curve there. There, there's so many things I want to do in the realm of fiction. So I'm more inclined to, and and I, it's maybe even deeper than that. I feel like you know everyone talks about how television is where all the great writing is. Television has lured away a lot of talented fiction writers and playwrights. Um, and I feel it more like I want to try to bend television to my purposes. I want to use its techniques to, to write fiction that is informed by them rather than walk away from what I'm doing and, and write for TV. I'm, I'm fascinated by that answer because you do bend prose writing to your will. Like you, the PowerPoint chapter is a, a prime example in Goon Squad, but you wrote a story to be entirely published on Twitter, for example. Like, you're, you're interested in where the edge of your medium is. Well, I feel that that's really where the novel started. I mean, if you look at the early novels, they're full of other forms, like letters, legal documents. You know, Tristram Shandy has, has weird graphics in it. So I feel like this is, I'm trying to, and that's why I'm so interested in the 19th century too. I feel sometimes that the novel was designed to be a grab bag. It was designed to synthesize all kinds of other forms and turn them into entertainment that couldn't, couldn't quite be affected using epic poetry, which was really what the kind of storytelling that preceded it. So that's, that's really what I'm trying to do. So rather than write for television, I feel like why not make television write for me? <laughs> Wasn't there going to be an HBO series of Goon Squad? Yeah, yeah. that was ages ago. It's yeah. kicked around here, there, and everywhere. And I think it, it is, uh, is poss it's still optioned, but nothing has worked. I mean, there are, Goon Squad is difficult. I, I can really understand why that's been hard. It has a wonderful producer named Michael London who's tried everything in the world and deserve. I wanted more for him than I do for me, honestly. <laughs> um, I, I really, it makes me sorry that all of his effort has gone unrewarded. Another reason not to write for television because I can do what I want to do. It doesn't require that anyone give me permission or decide to shoot a pilot or not shoot a pilot. I love the independent nature of fiction writing. Mm. Nice to hear someone defending fiction writing. There's a question up here. Do you read for pleasure during the writing process? I absolutely do. I mean, I sometimes try to, I mean, for example, well, it, it, one can be very influenced by what one is reading. And sometimes that influence doesn't actually enhance the, the immediate writing project. I don't worry about that because I feel like the, in, in the many revisions, I end up fleshing out influence that doesn't feel quite right. Um, but I, I find that in general, what I, what I crave to read is usually material that is somehow going to feed me fairly directly. So for example, when I was working on The Keep, I really read only Gothic fiction, um, which covers a huge time period, uh, for a couple of years. And it, it was all I wanted to read. I couldn't get enough of it. I just hungered for it. And that, you know, I, I'm, by that I'm, I'm talking about from Anne Radcliffe to Stephen King to Joyce Carol Oates. Um, and then, so for this book, I mostly read, you know, early 20th century fiction. Um, or first half of the 20th century. And that, that ran the gamut from classics, like John O'Hara, um, you know, uh, uh, Henry Roth, Call It Sleep, which is a masterpiece I had never read about Tenement New York, to the cheesiest of cheesy detective fiction, all of, which was all kind of equally useful to me. Um, so that was a lot of fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm always reading. Um, and and I, I take seriously my own cravings because I feel like, again, because I do sort of value the choices of my unconscious more than my conscious mind, I feel like what I should read is less important than what I want to read. Or maybe that's just a justification for indulging myself, but it, it, it's, uh, it, seems to, it seems to work. I think with this crowd, that's a justification that would be well received. <laughs> oh, yeah, forget should. It's about want. Over here. Um, you said you liked Victorian writers, and I was wondering which one was your favourite. Um, there isn't one. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's certain certain. I mean, Middlemarch is really pretty great. I have to say, that's that's. If I had to pick one book, that would probably be it. But. 
in a way, there's no reason to, to pick one book per se, because what I've been reading a lot of in the last year is Trollope. And to me, his greatness really becomes more clear in his constellations of books, the series, so the Barchester series and the Palliser series. They are amazing. And in fact, I just read one of his that is not part of either of those series, uh, The Way We Live Now, which is essentially about Donald Trump, as far as I can tell. I mean, it's a self-created con man who gets elected to parliament. And he's also kind of a Ponzi schemer. So that's sort of an, I mean, the work couldn't be more relevant. It's all about greed, self-interest, jealousy, pettiness. I mean, it's, it's, it's America. <laughs> um, so I love, I love that. I'm reading Elizabeth Gaskell right now for the first time, which I'm loving, North and South. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's you know, very much about, at least so far, you know, workers versus capital and those, those, um, that conflict and also the cultural differences in England. So I'm, I read around, I lo you know, I've loved Dickens. I mean, there are just some masterpieces there. Um, so, and, I, and those are just the English ones. I mean, I, I love Tolstoy. Zola is a huge favorite. Um, I love, Zola was such a journalist as a fiction writer. I mean, Germinal is really one of my favorite books. Um, amazing scenes in there, and also a lot of technical stuff about coal mining, so <laughs> that appeals to me. <laughs> right up your alley. It's, yeah. <laughs> that is quite the book list. Middlemarch and Germinal. Do you want to come back tomorrow night and just do a, a reading group with everyone? <laughs> that I would, would be fun. I would love it. <laughs> I would love that too. We have a question down here. Yeah, hey, when you spoke about... Um, not being sure whether Manhattan Beach would make a good movie and that was up to someone's vision. It kind of reminded me a bit of The Invisible Circus, which wasn't really a good movie. Um, like it kind of got bad reviews and it didn't get released in cinemas here in Australia. And as a reader, it seemed really disappointing to see how it was brought to screen. How did you feel about it? And what was it like, that experience for you as a writer and as a human seeing you know, this work that you had made be turned into something else? You know? it, was, it was kind of... I really enjoyed it, actually. I, lo I really like the, the guy who adapted it and directed it, and he was very welcoming to me. So even though I had no involvement in the writing, my mom and I went up, um, saw it, some of it being shot in Portugal. So I really enjoyed the experience of it. Um, I think it seems to me that the, the big question, I mean, writing is so interior. The, at fiction writing, that's to me its secret weapon. That's, that's the thing it has that nothing else has. It can actually put you inside the consciousness of another human being, not by inferring it things from looking at the person's face, but actually being inside their thoughts. Um, so you lose that in moving from fiction to film. And the question is how to compensate and ideally overcompensate or somehow provide even more use because the, the visual, visual tools are at one's disposal. And that seems like a really hard thing to do, I have to say. I, 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 but, you know, I'm not a filmmaker. Um, so I, I have to, I really was, it was not a bad experience for me. Um, it, I think uh, it was very eerie because I was still, you know, I was a fairly new fiction writer then, and it was it was very odd to hear someone like Cameron Diaz uttering lines I still remembered writing in my unair conditioned <laughs> East Village walk up, um, thinking that I would never publish a book probably. I, it was it was just one of those odd moments of thinking, wow, you know, things really can change in in a person's life. Um, so and, and maybe there were maybe there were disappointments along the way too, but somehow that's what I've been left with. Those really positive feelings about it. So, can we extrapolate from your current reading list that you're working on something that's going to be 19th century set? I really would love to. I'd love to write a book set in New York in the 19th century. I, I've become fixated, and I think this is a result of Manhattan Beach, on how. And actually, this is so true of Melbourne, which I've fallen in love with, because so much of the building stock is 19th century in New York still. I mean, it's disappearing by the minute, especially in Brooklyn. Um, but these old row houses, which were clearly built within a relatively short period of time, 
you know, we're still living in these 19th century structures. And I, I find that so fascinating. I, I feel like I want to write about the time when they were new. Um, so that's a fun idea. That won't be my next book, because I, that's going to take a huge amount of research. Um, and I better start writing, reading some American 19th century fiction, because I'm, I'm stuck in England um, perpetually. Um, but, that, but yes, that, I, I don't know if I'll write more historical novels than that, but if I can manage that, I would love it. And if I can find a way to somehow incorporate the American West, um, I just think, come on. I mean, I'm an American. I, I like playing the genre. There's got to be a Western in there somewhere. A, a Jennifer Egan Western is something that I will definitely be first in line at the bookshop to get. Please join me in thanking the extraordinary Jennifer Egan. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.